Hello to all my listeners and welcome to the Cardio Seeds podcast that is all about lifestyle medicine and provider burnout. I'm your host, Dr. Svetlana Shemon, a double board certified preventive cardiologist, lifestyle medicine physician, and health and wellness coach from the suburbs of Philadelphia. My amazing guests include absolutely cool physicians and other healthcare providers, and all of them have unbelievable stories to tell, from incredible personal tales of survival and resilience, to becoming successful entrepreneurs, to starting Blue Zones from scratch, and much, much more. Tune to Into Cardio Seeds podcast and listen to my discussion on a variety of lifestyle medicine topics. Starting a podcast was one of the best decisions I made in my life. And now we are available on every platform with a robust following from you, our listeners. Of course, none of this would be possible without Buzzsprout that let us build this podcast from scratch and launch it very, very efficiently. So, if you are dreaming about having your own podcast for the first time, Buzzsprout should be your choice. And with that, let's get started. Hello, hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Cardio Seeds podcast. I'm Dr. Svetlana Shemon, and the name of today's episode of the Cardio Seeds podcast is this, the Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy, Supporting Vitality, Longevity, and Purpose, Where We Live, Work, and Play. And for this fascinating discussion, we have an equally amazing guest. Dr. Megan Greger is an Ivy League school-trained family physician, but she's so much more than that. She embodies lifestyle medicine. She practices it, she teaches it, she lives it, she breathes it. She's a young, beautiful, energetic person, a super achiever, and she is a true leader in our rapidly growing field of lifestyle medicine. Dr. Megan Grega is a co-founder and the chief medical officer of Kellyn Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to making the healthy choice is the easy choice. Kellyn provides school-based healthy lifestyle education and garden as a classroom programs, supports access to nutrient-dense produce via the Eat Real Food Mobile Market. Engages participants in hands-on, plant-based cooking classes in community settings and offers intensive therapeutic lifestyle change interventions for individuals and families. Dr. Grega is a summa cum laude graduate of Bucknell University with a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and Cell Biology, and she earned her MD degree from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Dr. Grega spent several years as a medical officer in the United States Navy. Now she is the managing director of Len Tissant Retreat and Wellness Center. She is honored to serve as a faculty for the St. Luke's University Health Network Anderson Campus Family Medicine and Internal Medicine Residency Programs as a clinical assistant professor for the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University and as a faculty advisor for the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple Medical Student Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group. She frequently lectures on the topics of lifestyle medicine and local food systems and food access. Dr. Greg serves as a member of several national task force groups dedicated to the expansion of evidence-based lifestyle medicine services. Dr. Greg is a current 
Conference Chair for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Annual Meetings. She is a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians, a fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and is board certified in both family medicine and lifestyle medicine. Wow. Dr. Gregor, welcome to the Cardio Seeds podcast. It's our pleasure and honor to have you today. Oh, Dr. Shimon, it is so wonderful to be here with you, and I'm, I'm honored and excited to speak with you. Thank you for that very kind introduction, and I know that we're going to have lots of wonderful conversation today. Absolutely, my goodness. Dr. Gregor, that's such a, such a wonderful life that you had, both personal and, and professional. Let's start with you telling us about yourself. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? And, you know, tell us more about your upbringing. Well, um, I actually was born on a Navy base uh, back at, during the Vietnam War. My father was a uh, officer in the Navy. And uh, as, as you heard with my bio, I eventually kind of followed in those footsteps and spent some years as a naval officer as well. Mm-hmm. But then I, I kind of um, moved around a lot, mostly in the Northeast, uh, as my father finished like getting his education. And we eventually moved back to uh, the hometown that both of my parents grew up in, which is Easton, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been here, I was here for a couple of years, then I went off on my own journey going to Bucknell for medical school and, and Penn down in Philly for, for, I'm sorry, Bucknell for my, um, undergrad and then Penn down in Philly for medical school, uh, and then did my residency in New Jersey. And I would say like a lot of what for me, as I was growing up, I, I've always been a very, um, physically active outdoors type of person. Uh, I've always loved science, but I wasn't really thinking about becoming a doctor because there, there aren't any other physicians in my family. Mm-hmm. I was really intrigued with this concept of being um, oh, something that we would call a shaman, somebody who was really kind of involved in their community and was, was supporting the health and the wellness, but also the social connections and kind of like helping everybody live the best life that they possibly could. Mm -hmm. And when I went to my high school guidance counselor and said that that was kind of what I wanted to be when I grew up, she was like, I don't think there's any programs really for that in college, but what do you think about being a doctor? And I was like, well, that sounds good. Let's look into that. And family medicine was to me the closest thing that I could think of to being that kind of like, almost like the, the old family doc that we used to see in, mm-hmm. uh, in TV shows when I was growing up. Taking, you know, ho- taking office, house calls. Yeah. The whole family. Mm-hmm. That sort of thing. And that's how I ended up becoming a family medicine doctor. It wasn't until later that I learned about the lifestyle medicine, um, the impact that that could have for my patients. Wow. So don't tell me that was a school nurse. Who actually sent you to medical school? No, was my guidance counselor. <laughs> she was trying to help me out. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so it was in Eastern Pennsylvania where it happened. Yeah, well, that's where I went to high school. Yep, I graduated from Eastern High School. I'm a Red Rover. That's that's our mascot. And I actually eventually, after you know, going to college and medical school and residency in the Navy and all those different things, I eventually moved back home to Eastern Pennsylvania, which is uh, where I live now. My parents live here. Uh, my sister and her family live here. And I am fortunate that both of my adult children live here as well. So we have mm-hmm. a whole extended family that uh, can help support each other. The whole family is here. So when did you when did you finally went to medical school? How was it for you? Well, when I went to medical school, I went like I said, I went to Penn, and I have to say that the people there were amazing. I mean, being surrounded by such passionate and intelligent and like driven uh, colleagues, medical students, and also the faculty, obviously, you know, like some of the really the, the best uh, clinicians and researchers in the world was really, really inspiring. You know, medical school was difficult as it, as it is for all of us from a, from a time management and, mm-hmm. and managing stress standpoint. But I really, really enjoyed the people I was with and the learning that I did. Mm-hmm. The thing that I did that we didn't get to do a whole lot of was learn anything about stuff like nutrition or mm-hmm. stress management or, you know, a little bit about sleep, but it was more about obstructive sleep apnea or narcolepsy or, you know, some of the things that are more of the the medical problems. We 
we didn't learn much about how do you stay healthy. We learned mm-hmm. very much and lots of good things about, hey, if somebody's sick, what's the you know top notch Western medicine way to, to deal with that, you know, the, the cutting edge medications and procedures. Mm-hmm. Yep. But there wasn't a lot of focus on how do you keep people from getting diabetes in the first place or how do you keep them from getting a heart heart disease. Now, I didn't really notice because I was just trying to learn everything I could when yeah. I was at medical school. Yeah. It was really later when I was starting to take care of my own patients and seeing how um, the chronic disease epidemic was affecting them and their families that I thought, you know, I'm doing all the things I was taught at you know, an Ivy League, you know, very excellent medical school to do and in a, you know, really excellent residency program. I'm doing all these things that are evidence-based guidelines, but I don't really see people getting better. And that's when I started to look into what about the places of the world where people live the longest, like the blue zones that uh, I'm sure you've talked about at different times with with your um, podcast guests. And what about the places where people don't need a whole lot of medications and yet heart disease is is very rare? And that's when I found, uh, let's see, Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Yeah. and T, Dr. T. Colin Campbell and Neil Barnard and all these you know amazing lifestyle medicine pioneers. I found their research completely on my own. It wasn't something that I was taught in medical school or residency, which I think most physicians of my age would say the same, you know, that that's just not something that was part of our curriculum, (laughs) but it's out there in the medical literature. And it really provided a different perspective for me on how I could help my patients live their best lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you, what do you think it's not a medical school curriculum? Back then, uh, because I went to medical school in the 90s, so it was was last century. That's what I I always say. So so, so did I. I was was training in the last century. Uh, And at that point, there was already a lot of this uh, uh, information in the medical literature about at least food as medicine and definitely some about physical activity. I don't know that there was as much about social connection as we have now, but you know, like that, that was in the literature, but it definitely had not made its way into medical school curriculum. And I think truly we are trained in America, at least, to utilize the pharmaceuticals and the procedures and the, the lab tests and all that stuff that, that are kind of the predominant part of the system. And so when you tell somebody uh, if we're talking about looking at a curriculum and say, oh, hey, did you know you could actually reverse diabetes based on what people are eating? That just wasn't part of the medical paradigm. It was considered once you started on insulin, you were going to be on insulin for the rest of your life. And, you know, if you had a heart attack, you were going to have to be on all these medications forever. And it's true once you've had a heart attack, there are some medications that maybe would be wise to stay on, but, you know, cholesterol medications or um, things like uh, things to, as far as your blood pressure. Mm-hmm. It was just that we didn't have many examples of success stories where people had, for example, lost a lot of weight or mm-hmm. reversed their diabetes or their high blood pressure without using medications or surgeries. And so I just don't think even our faculty members or our professors knew about the that information. And so it wasn't taught. Right, right. I, I understand. So do you think, do you think the future, I mean, uh, I'm trying to you know, jump from from one thing to another right now. And there are so many questions I would like to ask you in between. But kind of, you know, before I forget, do you think that now that we know this information, um, this will be, you know, put in the curricula of medical schools or residency program curricula and the situation will change in the future? Um, Maybe not this generation that has been trained now, but maybe, you know, people who are about to start medical schools in their time or the time after that, eventually. Um, Because, look, I think what's happening now that uh, medicine is is getting more and more, you know, privatized, right? Um, it's not, I'm not sure whether it's going to be reversed or not, this, this medicine for profit that, that it, you know, practices and hospitals and other facilities are uh, purchased essentially by hedge funds, by, you know, uh, private equities, et cetera, et cetera. So doctors don't have that much of a uh, of freedom of practicing medicine they want to so um how you think this will be equated into you know teaching medical students and residents 
to practice lifestyle medicine um, if they cannot or they don't have freedom of practicing it in the future, or it's not it's not related to one another. And I think that's an excellent question, and I'm I'm happy to say that uh, being I'm I'm blessed to be a part of the educational faculty for both medical school and residents, and I am so impressed with the doctors, the student doctors that are coming through the system now because they get it, like they understand that they I'm sorry that um, food as medicine and and all the different things that we do as our lifestyle make a big impact. Not all of them do, but they're much more open to it, and they're very much looking at the system, the whole medical system, with different eyes than we did uh, in my generation of doctors. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're not just willing to absorb the status quo that, that's being taught to them. They're questioning, you know, why does, why is it this way? Why is with social determinants of health? Can we not, you know, help our patients as far as um, getting access to healthy food or transportation to their doctor's appointments? You know, why is it that we um, are not able to refer patients to a health coach or to somebody who can help them change their, their lifestyle habits. They like, they're, they're not just accepting where, what they're being taught, they're questioning and they are very passionate about uh, changing the system to make it not only work better for patients, but to work better for them as physicians, because you know, burnout is a huge issue. Uh, it seems seemingly getting worse year by year. Uh, and, and the young doctors are just, they're not going to, they, they're not looking for the career where they work so hard, they don't get to see their families and they're stressed the whole time and they mm-hmm. just make it until they can retire and then they start enjoying their life. You know, like mm-hmm. they, they want to be able to mix uh, an impactful, you know, meaningful career with their own health and their own ability to have relationships outside of medicine. And they're just as a, as a group, not willing to tolerate I think, some of the things that we just took for granted as we were going through in my age of doctors. Mm-hmm. And it's a great thing because I feel like they're going to be the force that really does kind of break the current system and, and remake it in a better way. Mm-hmm. But they're not operating alone, luckily, as far as like some of the things that you were talking about, there are definitely forces in medicine that are consolidating it and capitalizing on it and really trying to just squeeze as much money out of it as possible. Mm-hmm. But there's also other forces that are looking at it saying, this is unsustainable. Like when, when I was in medical school in the 90s, we didn't have anywhere near the same health care cost per person no. that we do now in this country. Like now it's over $11,000 per person per year. Mm-hmm. Not even health care costs. That's like, this is for sick care, basically, you know, so we're spending a huge amount of money on people and people like employers are saying, hey, this is not going to work. People like the government with, you know, Medicare, Medicaid are saying this is just not going to work. We're going to have to figure out ways to take care of people with less money. Well, one of the ways you could do that is rationing. And that's not good. Like none of us want to be rationing health care and telling people, oh, you can't have health care. But another way to do it is to actually help people be healthier so that they don't have to spend as much money on their, um, on, you know, their healthcare. And that is where lifestyle medicine will come in because if you can reverse somebody's diabetes so that they don't have to be on all the medications that they're on, if you can prevent one heart attack, that means that they, that you prevent one, um, coronary artery bypass graft, that's a massive amount of money that you're saving. And eventually the, and I think the process has started, the people who are funding healthcare are looking at this going, we've got to change this and not just accept the fact that it costs, you know, over $11,000 per person per year to have Americans in the relatively poor state of health that we are. So I think with the younger generation of doctors and the fact that our current funding system for, for uh, the medical system in this country, our, our funding paradigm, it's just they're not sustainable. And so we're going to have to make something new. And I'm hopeful that we will go in the direction of lifestyle medicine, which would be better for everybody, mm-hmm. instead of going in a direction that's like limiting care for certain groups of people. Right, right. Well, I, ho- I hope I hope this is the case, because I, I, I can see also the tag of war between um, the uh, People like like us, you know, who are trying to save money to the taxpayers, to, to the population as a whole, and the healthcare system, and also the other group of people who are advocating, you know, filling up beds and keeping, you know, hospital beds filled, not empty, and at the same time, you know, 
telling people medications and and also you know um selling selling people as expensive medical care as possible that's what i'm trying to say the keeping keeping people sick not healthy so for for a small group of people in this country i think it makes a you know, sense or physical sense to keep people sicker, not healthier. And unfortunately, have, unfortunately yeah, and probably uh, there will be a resistance to a certain extent to um, our initiatives of lifestyle medicine. But um, it's it's clear that it's not sustainable. It's clear that the, um, you know, the, the healthcare system is going to collapse if something is not it's not done. It's not reversed um, towards prevention and uh, towards um, um, preventive care and re- reduction of cost per, per person per capita or in general. The um, uh, you know. The- I would love to give just one example of that that I've been recently telling people. So we should all go out and like tell our Congress people this, <laughs> tell our tell our employers this, you know, tell our friends so that we all know. For example, um, obesity is a is a definite um, issue here in this country. You know, almost 40 percent of American adults would classify uh, by medical criteria as being obese. Mm-hmm. And we know that obesity is not the issue itself, per se. It's it's not what you look like. It's not the weight of, you know, like how how does that um from an aesthetic standpoint, it's it's the metabolic problem that goes along with obesity that increases your risk of diabetes and, and you know, heart disease and hypertension and all those things. And so when you look at obesity, because I, I know there's a lot of um, kind of body positivity uh, movement, which is very important, you know, like beautiful at any size, right. absolutely. But as far as being healthy mm-hmm. and, you know, having a long life, we know that people who have who fall into the obese category may have a shorter life and not be as healthy. So there's all sorts of procedures and medications that are used to try to help people lose weight. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the ones most recently, um, it's called liraglutide, and there's another one, semax, uh, semaglutide, mm-hmm. that are injectable <laughs> things that have been shown to help people lose weight. It turns out that they cost somewhere between, you know, upwards of $35 per day to use them for for weight loss. And they do produce some weight loss. Mm -hmm. But we always say, oh, we can't afford to give people food, right? Like we can't do medically tailored meals or we can't afford that. You could easily provide medically tailored meals for people for that cost, for that like $35 a day without a problem. Like it'd be way cheaper than that. Mm -hmm. And you could end up having even um, better weight loss outcomes, but also at the same time, improving some of the other things like uh, hyper, like your lipid panel and your, mm-hmm. your blood sugar. So there was recently, so that's part of what I tell people. I'm like, we say that we don't have enough money to look at food as medicine and, and medically tailored meals, but yet we are spending that money in a different way mm-hmm. on medications. Why can't we just shift? So it's not that it's going to cost more money. It's just shifting where we are willing to put our resources mm-hmm. so that people can help to start training their taste buds and all that with healthier food. And so there was a um, article that was published earlier this year that looked at, it was a modeling study that looked at the impact of medically tailored meals and from a cost standpoint. Mm -hmm. And because of using them, the goal or the the modeling study found like a really massive decrease in hospitalizations and medication use and all that stuff. So much so that for the population that they modeled this on, that they found that you would actually save 13 some billion dollars, like over 13 billion dollars a year. You would save that even after the cost of the meals mm-hmm. compared to not using the meals at all. So it's like we have to think about it as a paradigm shift. Mm-hmm. It's not that it's going to cost necessarily more money. It's actually going to save us money in the long run. It's that we're spending the money on things that are not really helping our patients get healthier. Right, right. Wow, that's very educational. <laughs> Um, Dr. Greg, listen, let's go back in time. And I have this question uh, about you being the medical officer at the U.S. Navy. How did it happen? And what did you do there? (laughs) So as I I mentioned, I was born on a Navy base. Yes. If you are born at a Naval hospital, I feel like the U.S. military keeps track of you for the rest of your life. (laughs) They were always sending me things about like, hey, do you want to join? (laughs) <laughs> oh boy. And so when I 
I joined up or when I started medical school, I was, they contacted me and they said, there's this thing called the health professional scholarship program with the Navy and, uh, they, you apply for it. And if you are accepted, then they pay for medical school and then you owe them some time afterwards. And I had already paid for my first year of Penn, which was a relatively expensive experience. <laughs> and I could loans and things. You know, I'd already loans. And I had decided by that point after my first year of medical school or somewhere in the middle of my first year of medical school that I wanted to be a family doc. And that's not one of the more uh, financially compensating type of specialties. And I was it's looking not. at my, you know, kind of loans that I was taking and and what I wanted to do as a career. And I have a really, a really strong connection to the Navy, um, having come from a military family and, you know, a lot of, a lot of respect and a lot of honor for the, um, for our armed forces. So I looked into it and I was accepted for the, for the program. And so then for the last three years of medical school, I had been sworn in as a Naval officer and I was, I was an ensign at that point in the United States Navy. I was sworn in at the, um, recruiting center in Philadelphia, which is uh, one of the, one of the big ones for, mm-hmm. the, for the military. And I was, uh, I would go on active duty for a couple weeks a year and also was um, supported basically by the Navy to be able to do a lot of the things financially, like my, my uh, tuition was taken care of and, mm-hmm. and all my, my, my stethoscope and, you know, all the <laughs> and then uh, after you know, after getting my family medicine training is when I went on active duty. So I, I basically joined the Navy in medical school. I stayed on uh, kind of what's called the inactive list when I was in residency, but I would still go, um, you know, do a little bit of duty time here and there. And then once I graduated from my residency, they um, assigned me to a military base in Maryland where I was uh, one of the only physicians that was there. So that was an interesting thing to go right from right from residency to being like, the, the only physician on the on the base, but I had lots of great people <laughs> up at Bethesda that I could get in touch with, and you know, it was a really, really good experience from the standpoint of taking care of a group of people that, you know, we're, we're making either currently amazing sacrifices for our country, because mm-hmm. during that time was during 9-11 and um, the uh, bombing of the USS Cole wow. and the Afghanistan War, mm-hmm. like all that stuff was going on at that point. Mm-hmm. But I also had the had the honor of taking care of veterans from like the Korean War and the Vietnam War and mm-hmm. and um, Desert Storm and all of that sort of thing. So wow. it was a really good experience to do. Um, what I realized in the in the Navy is that again, this is resource allocation. You know, kind of like what we have in the civilian world that we have to worry about. Mm-hmm. That the the military. Uh, puts the majority of their resources to the active duty to keep the fighting forces fit and ready. And that's like what you would expect to do. But then there's a huge amount of people who were prior military, you know, our veterans that um, have been you know, kind of promised really good health care for the rest of their lives. And mm-hmm. they are what is called space available, like wherever they get in. That's mm-hmm. where they, they do it. That's a hard way to manage chronic disease for people. You know, like if they're at yeah. one, one military base for their care at one time and then they can't get a, another appointment there. So they have to go to another doctor and then mm-hmm. maybe they go. So I was in something called the National Capital Region, which is uh, it down by D.C. And so there was a ton of different bases and a ton of different hospitals and everything. And so the, the re- and it's also a lot of a place where a lot of people retire. Mm-hmm. And so we had veterans kind of bopping around from place to place to place. And that's a, that is kind of the time where I was really starting to think about how can we keep these, you know, people who had, who did amazing things and served our country and now are in their seventies and have hypertension, have diabetes, have heart disease. Like how can we do a better job mm-hmm. keeping them healthy? Uh, and at the time it was a, it was a frustration that I wasn't sure how to, how to address very well. Definitely. Whenever we had something that we needed for our active duty, we could get them uh, an appointment. And I have to say then once I went into the civilian world, we run into similar problems in the civilian <laughs> world. I just didn't realize that it was going to be as as uh, yeah. kind of similar. But I am happy to say that the military is actually making a lot of strides in whole person health, uh, the Air Force especially, but the, the VA in general is trying to really start. Like the VA, believe it or not, is actually one of the leaders in lifestyle medicine now. That was know. happening when I was in I know. Yeah. active duty, but now it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know, yeah. 
VA has uh, many things. You know, the VA was the one of the first systems that introduced EMR, actually, electro- electronic medical records for our listeners. I think they, um, they united all their systems with electronic medical records. They were very primitive at first, but I remember in the 90s, they were, they were already here. And it was very mm-hmm. easy because I trained in Virginia in one of the hospitals that we had to rotate through was the VA. So it was like, wow, <laughs> I opened it. <laughs> When they were ruled out to our, because we had them um, when I was on active duty as well. Definitely not at all what they are like now. Yeah, but it was an important thing because you know yes. you have people going all across the world, and you need to be able to figure mm-hmm. out the lab results, whether they're in Germany or whether they're in exactly or yes. in California. Yes, that was great. So right, so you know, let us jump back to to your current things that you've been doing and talk about the Kellyn Foundation and, um, uh, the uh, you know, the things that you've been doing now with it and how, how did it start, first of all? Who, I'm interested, who are the founders? Who funds it now? What's, what's been involved, you know? And what is the Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy? Wonderful. That's a that's a whole lot of good stuff. I know, I know. But this is this is the current the current life life of, of Megan, the, yeah, Doctor Gregor nowadays. Absolutely. So, Kellen Foundation uh, came out of my frustration with uh, my ability to truly help people change their lifestyles in my primary care family medicine office. So, you know, I left after I left the Navy, I was in the Navy for many years, and then I left the Navy and joined a civilian family medicine practice uh, in New Jersey right. that was part of the, the same hospital system that I did my residency in. And so, you know, there's, I really thought there, there, there were, there were great doctors there, I had great colleagues, and I thought if there's any place that I can make medicine work the way I want to do medicine, it would be here at this this health system. Because I, you know, already had all the connections and I knew that the the doctors were great mm-hmm. as far as like great people and but I really found the at that point I was just on that treadmill of fifteen minute visits and getting double booked and mm-hmm. you know, not having the having three extra hours of of paperwork to do at night after the after the clinic closed. No, so you had you had all of that. You 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 had to face all of that, right? Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And mm-hmm. finding that I could not make the changes that I I wanted to in my own schedule to be able to um to to provide more time for patient or and, and what really actually got to me was the kids because I had a, a lot of pediatric patients in my panel and I was taking care of the whole families and mm-hmm. I found during the years that I was there that in that in that position as a doctor there that the children that I was seeing were really having low fitness levels yeah. you know, they were they were uh, having issues with the types of foods that they were willing to eat and they they had they were in the overweight or obese spectrum on their growth charts mm-hmm. and I was talking to the parents about you know what sort of physical activity are they doing and sugar sweetened beverages and decreasing screen time and eating more fruits and vegetables and like all the stuff that we're taught to talk about but it was during their like you know, their well child visit with all the other things like the immunizations and that. Mm-hmm. And the other you can do it in fifteen yeah. minutes. By yeah, the way, by the way, time. by the way, not to interrupt and not to not mm-hmm. to you know jump in between, but still, why could not you change the way um, uh, this was practiced? Why couldn't you make this you know twenty five minutes visits? Were you told to do? Right. Why? Why well, could? Because I was a uh, I was. Uh, our practice was a hospital owned practice. So uh, it was not our choice. Uh, yeah. We were on a what's called an RVU system. Oh, and we still yeah. are, which is self evaluated. So, yeah, you know, no. so, you know, like I, I went to the, yeah. the um, scheduler people and said, mm-hmm. This is what I want to do. And mm-hmm. they just, that's, that was not something that they, yeah. they understood, but they said, they, We just can't do it. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> that even though I was doing everything that I thought I could in my office to to help these kids because I was really worried 
about what their trajectory was going to be since I knew their parents and I knew their grandparents and I knew that there was chronic disease in their family, like diabetes or, or hypertension or stroke. And I was afraid they were just like heading down the same pathway and I wasn't effective at, at doing anything sure. to change that. So that's when I went to my administrators at the hospital and said, hey, where should I refer these kids to? Because, you know, I'm not making progress. And like, can I send them to dietitians? And they were like, nope, because they don't have a billable diagnosis. So you can't send them. It's such a frustrating situation, I can imagine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was like, okay. So I said, well, can I see them more frequently and maybe start doing group visits, which had was really not heard of back then. That was in the early 2000s. And so group visits were not very common. Hmm. And they're like, nope, you can't do that because it's not a billable diagnosis for you either, you know? And I said, well, then what, what do I do? Because they're, you know, they're not sick yet, but they're gonna, they're mm -hmm. headed in that direction. Yeah. And they basically said, well, how about if you send them to the Y? And I said, well, that's great. I mean, the YMCA has amazing programs and it's a great place to be physically active, but I really feel like they need more like ongoing support and, and especially structure support at the beginning yeah. to change their lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And there just was no way to do that in the structure of structure. My, yeah. hospital, or my, my, my private or health network owned office. And so when you said, who are the co-founders? I have uh, a very good friend for a long, long time. His name is Mr. Eric Ruth, and he is the CEO of Kellen Foundation. Mm -hmm. But at the time, he and I were, were basically just friends. And I was talking about my frustration of that I wasn't able to make a difference in the lives of these kids and that I had no place to send them. And he said, well, why don't we just create the program that you wish that you could send your families to? Mm -hmm. And that's how Kellen Foundation started. Is So mm -hmm. we have the co-founder and Eric is the co-founder and uh, I'm the chief medical officer. He's the chief uh, executive officer because he's, he's a business dude. So he's mm -hmm. got all of that good information. And the two of us together just decided to create something outside of the medical system right. that we thought would be effective and that was in 2007 and I'm happy to say that now it's 2023 over the years I feel like the medical system as a whole is coming more around to those types of ideas that we were trying to do back in 2007 but we had to do it outside the medical system at that time to make it work mm -hmm. i think it's a little bit more feasible to do it within the medical system now but it's very effective to do out in the community as well almost 20 years dr Greg. <laughs> oh my goodness that's right <laughs> Yeah, we started over 15 years ago. 15, almost, yeah, over 15 yeah. years. And, you know, I'm wondering if 15 years from now we'll be still talking that it's still not, you know, it's still not up to scale. Uh, oh, I uh, hope not, but you might be right. Oh, <laughs> there's been a lot of progress, I think, over yeah. the last, especially like the last uh, five years or so. I feel like, I feel like the... Um, we're reaching a tipping point of yeah, we have to, and allied health professionals and mm -hmm. people who actually see that this works, that right. it is not yeah. just like sort of a voodoo or, or wishful sure. thinking, but no, it actually works. And so there's more and more people and more and more uh, payers mm -hmm. that are trying to figure out how to make this work because they now see that it is as effective, if not more effective uh, than the, um, the current system and the best thing is i love how dean ornish always says he's always saying like it's not different diets it's like one way of eating for heart disease but it's the same way of eating for reversing diabetes sure. and it's the same way of eating for uh decreasing your cholesterol and decreasing your risk of stroke mm -hmm. and hypertension and mm -hmm. and it's not just food like i know that's what we talk about a lot for lifestyle medicine but and it's definitely one of the most important pillars but there's mm -hmm. also the impact definitely of physical activity stress management sleep social connection and avoidance of risky substances so you gotta wrap all that together into programs and things that help patients make those changes um, based on what it is that they need the most assistance in. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of people out there that are doing well with physical activity and they're like, running marathons, but yet almost at every marathon, people have heart attacks because mm -hmm. they are doing the physical activity pillar. They're doing really well with that, but they are maybe not doing as well with the nutrition, stress mm -hmm. management, sleep pillar, you know? Sure. Sure. Yeah. 
So we'll tell me more about the, the work that Kellen Foundation is doing. What is the Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me, tell me the details. Absolutely. So, the, so when we started out back in 2007, we really only started with our intervention program. We we're mm-hmm. very healthcare based or focused, even though we were doing it outside the, the traditional healthcare system. But what we've learned over the past 15 years is really the importance of trying to, uh, what we call, this is our tagline, of making the healthy choice the easy choice. Mm-hmm. You know, you, the default system, or situation that you're in is what is most likely for people to choose. So if you are in a situation where the default is you know, junk food and nobody really does much physical activity, maybe they don't feel safe in their neighborhood or they're, they're time crunched so much they're really not moving their body around, they're just in the car going from thing to thing. And if you're at a place where people are, when I say place, I mean like sort of like a community where your default is, oh, you're expected to stay up really late and either, you know, hang out and watch Netflix or, or you're responding to emails until 1 a.m. Or, like if that's your default, that's what most people are going to do. If that's what the community's default is. Yeah. Whereas if the default in your family or your friend group is that you're likely to go out and do hikes on the weekends. Like that's how you hang out together. Or you're likely to have a plant-based type of potluck. You're not going to bring some of the the kind of standard American diet. You're going to bring lots of different healthier options. Well, then that's most likely what you're going to do as well. And we see this when residents rotate through um, the lifestyle medicine rotation and they spend a lot of time with us in Kelly kitchens, they just start eating healthier because that's what's around them at that point. Like they're cooking it. That's what staff meal is. They're able to take some of it home with them. And without making any major changes, they're like, this is delicious. It tastes great. And they shift to eating healthier food mm-hmm. when they go back into their regular life in the hospital. Some of them manage to continue with the healthier food options and some of them kind of fall back into the standard because that's what's around them at that point. So there's such a huge impact of what is our environment like that on our health. Mm-hmm. And that's what Kellen decided to really focus on. And that's what the Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy is all about. It's about kind of focusing in on neighborhoods and we use an elementary school catchment area as our focus for neighborhoods. So the elementary school is a hub. It's already a place where people in the neighborhood gather, have relationships, you know, it's, it's, it's it's convenient. And we have four uh, pillars of our healthy neighborhood immersion strategy. There's Kellen schools, which has to do with interactive in classroom and out at the garden, uh, programming for third, fourth, and fifth graders. I'll talk about healthy lifestyles and eating real food and label reading and all sorts of stuff like that. Plus the garden as a classroom program, which is uh, growing their own food in school gardens. So that's pillar number one. Pillar number two is Kellen Kitchens, which is doing whole food plant-based cooking class series in these areas and these in these community locations where people actually cook with us and eat with us. And we talk about, um, you know, the recipes, but also things that they could do to, to shift it around a little bit. And uh, it's a social thing, too, because it's people doing it together and sitting and eating together. Mm-hmm. Then the, uh, the third pillar is Kellen Lifestyle Medicine, and that's the intervention programs that we do out. The, it's kind of like intensive therapeutic lifestyle change programs out in the community. And then the fourth pillar is the food access, Kellen Food Access. Mm-hmm. And that has to do with the Eat Real Food mobile market, which brings uh, fresh local produce, but also things from farther away, you know, like bananas and pineapples and prepared meals, the lifestyle medicine prepared food, as well as like whole grains and and beans and things like that, out into these areas that lack access to a grocery store. So Uh bring out this this trailer every week, uh, same sites every week. We're there for like two hours or so in the same sites so that those neighborhoods can count on us as their healthy grocery store on wheels, mm-hmm. which provides access and also starts to shift that social norm of, hey, you know, having fruits and vegetables is something that we have in this community. It's something that, that we want to have. And there's no doubt that people do want that type of food. It's just that it hasn't been accessible or it hasn't been affordable. And that's a big piece of what we have to work on with uh, our whole food system and our health system. Right, right. Making the healthier foods accessible and affordable for people to be able to access. So those are the four components. And when you wrap them all together, it helps shift the kind of culture of those neighborhoods to make sure that people are supporting each other in healthy choices. So you start in fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. 
right? Th those oh, educated. Uh, yeah. Actually, third, fourth, and fifth. Wow, this early. And and do you find kids listening to you? They have been interested in this, or um, or the parents more so, or how does it work? How do you very much so? Yeah. Oh, the kids love it. Yeah, the kids love it because we like sing songs with them, we play games with them, we talk about them being food detectives and uh -huh. all these toys out of things. And so they love it when they see us. And we bring in food like um, snacks like hummus, homemade hummus and carrots, or a salad with a honey mustard dressing or things. So whenever they see us walking in in our green Kellen t shirts, they're like, What did you bring me to eat? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so so you. It. Right. You arrange this. A lot of questions. Do you arrange it with like the school principal? Or how do you do this? How how did you zero down on the on the school aspect? So we, like I said, when we started in Kellen Foundation mm -hmm. with the intervention program that we started with, mm -hmm. but we we realized that when the um, participants in the intervention program were with Eric and I going through the intensive time of lifestyle change, they did really well. The families did really well. And then they would go back out into the community, and, which I kind of think of as an obesogenic environment, and they would struggle because mm -hmm. they didn't have a lot of support around them. And at the time, I was the doctor on the Eastern Area School District Wellness Committee. And as such, I was I had the opportunity to be able to talk to the superintendent and the, you know, uh, the person for pupil services. And I said, I really think we need to start teaching about this yeah. in the elementary school so kids learn early on some of the healthiest choices for their body. And why is that? Like, so that they, you know, it's not that, uh, you know, they say Red Bull gives you wings. Like, there's yeah. all this marketing that makes it sound like <laughs> the unhealthy food is going to, you know, be giving you the, the power to do what you want to do. And we needed to counter that by saying, like, no, the things that really mean that you can you know, be doing great on the soccer field or, you know, really great for your brain for so that you can practice your clarinet or, you know, whatever you want to do are more of these fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole grains and beans. Mm -hmm. And luckily they said, sure, as long as it doesn't cost the district any money, you can, you know, you can put, <laughs> put together a curriculum. And they, they allowed us to start in the Eastern Area School District. And we built the curriculum so that it's third, fourth, and fifth grade so that we see them every year for those three years mm -hmm. plus the gardens. And they get multiple touch points. And then once Easton had that, the Eastern Area School District, then Bethlehem Area School District and Allentown Area School District was like, how come we don't have it? And then mm -hmm. so we doing it in those schools. And now we're up to eight different school districts. Uh, we wow. see about 10,000 students every year mm -hmm. in this program throughout the different, we have Alley um, Elementary Schools. And right. close to 40 schools that we're in. I think it's maybe 35, 36 at this point. And um, we could go, we could do more. The, the thing yes. that's challenging is uh, from a financial standpoint is getting the funding to cover it because mm -hmm. the schools really don't have that in their budget. Mm -hmm. But we've got great outcomes data that the, the students learn, the, they love the program, the teachers love the program. And like you mentioned parents. So mm -hmm. we send home things uh, to the parents as well. And then the teachers will often use some of the information that we teach to make homework assignments so that the kids are doing it at home. So mm -hmm. like, for example, we teach the red, yellow, green stop, uh, stoplight way of looking at packaged goods. Mm -hmm. And so we teach the kids how to look at the nutrition label. Mm -hmm. And then the teacher may send home a homework assignment saying, you know, find five things in your cupboard and, and decide whether they're red, yellow, or green. <laughs> They would, they would throw well. everything out of the cardboard. <laughs> pantry, pantry gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Mom comes from work, pantry gone. <laughs> and I think that really helps too. Like, because if a kid goes home and is like, I had this amazing hummus today, mm -hmm. we've had parents call us. They're like, Where did you get that hummus? <laughs> yeah, no idea. My kid would eat hummus. You know? And the parents call home, parents call call school next morning. Why my fridge is empty when I came from work? Well, because they had just this, this interesting class last night, and as a result, they threw everything out of the fridge. And we, and we do talk about that. It doesn't mean you never eat a red food, you know. Sometimes special occasions, or you might eat them every once in a while, but that the majority of foods that you should be eating are whole, fresh, or at least unprocessed uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and beans. Mm -hmm. And then if you're looking at packaged foods, as many of the green category foods as possible, some of the yellow, not many of the red, but mm -hmm. it's a balance, you know, because, you know, it, when we think about what most people in this country are eating, 
we have a long way to go (laughs) optimal nutrition but if you hit them with that all at once it's kind of sets them up for failure whereas if you look at hey can you switch your snack Mm -hmm. to being an apple or being and and this this is an issue for kiddos if they're in areas where they don't have fruit available so we talk about making the healthiest choice based on what you have available Mm -hmm. because you're you're always going to have a couple of there's always probably going to be a difference. Even for example, one of our questions is what would be your healthier choice if all you had available for a snack were pretzels, smart food, or potato chips. So even that type of food detective thing helps you make the healthiest choice no matter what. Now, of course, an apple or some grapes would be healthier than all three of those things, Mm -hmm. but the pretzels would be falling into usually a green category based on their sugar and fat, and um, especially if they could be low salt. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, oh my gosh, this is such a great work. I mean, you know, teaching third grade how to eat. Pro- I wish also that, you know, we can teach the parents how to use their limited budget because a lot of families really live from one, from the paycheck to paycheck. How to mm-hmm. use limited budget or even food stamps to buy and cook healthy. Because yeah. what always has been in the back of my mind is that they have, you know, $300 per week or even more for food only. And they have, you know, three, four, five people in the family to feed um, a family for that amount of money, you know. What are they going to buy? If we can teach them that, how to spend money, you know, that that budget to buy healthy food and what techniques to use to, to prepare that food. Um, to feed right. the whole family, you know, to to give them recipes to feed the whole family for that um, amount of money. And that's what the Kellen Kitchens, the cooking class, is mm-hmm. about. So when we when we do our cooking class series, we provide the recipes and we also break down like what the cost would be. Mm-hmm. And our recipes that we use, they have to be less than two dollars per serving, and most of them are more like a dollar per serving or less because mm-hmm. they use so much. Uh, they use beans and you know tomatoes and yeah. onions and uh, the things that are are not very expensive. Mm-hmm. But it's teaching people how to cook with that and make something that they would like to eat. That is a right. challenge. And so when people get involved, families, you know, and the parents and the grandparents get involved in the cooking classes, that helps them learn those sorts of the skills of, and I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, if you only have $300 for the week and you got a lot of people, it's, it's a challenge. But if you get a massive container of oatmeal Mm -hmm. that's going to be a lot cheaper really and a lot healthier Mm -hmm. than some of the breakfast cereals that people end up um, spending their money on because that's kind of like what people are used to doing is getting breakfast cereals yeah of course Mm -hmm. it's cheaper to get a lot of brown rice and a Mm -hmm. lot of uh but even the frozen vegetables so we talk about that a lot too that it doesn't have to be fresh broccoli it can be frozen broccoli it can be frozen spinach and like in our areas here you can get a pretty good chunk of um I guess it'd be about a pound, maybe a little bit less of, or maybe about, I'm not sure. It's that around a pound of frozen spinach mm-hmm. for 99 cents. Right. So if you, and I'm not saying that that's, you know, cheap, cheap, but it's definitely something that you can throw that then into your chili or into your stir fry, mm-hmm. get a lot of nutrition mm-hmm. out of that 99 cents worth of food. So yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with helping people see where are the less expensive um, whole foods? Because everybody goes, well, the strawberries are so expensive. Well, yeah, I mean, berries are very expensive. Mm-hmm. But apples, usually not so much. They're not. So yeah. well, bananas are less expensive. Bananas, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Well, that's amazing. You covered all the bases. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. And even the prices. It, it really is a community uh, intervention. That's yeah. Really, you know, it's something that it's not just actually there's a study or an infographic from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation mm-hmm. that that looks at you know where what is the impact of different things like our health care system or um, the the environment and all this on your long term health and, and morbidity. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that really only 20 percent of our long term health outcome is based on the type of doctors and nurses and health systems that mm-hmm. we can access, like their quality. Mm-hmm. 80% has to do with socioeconomic factors, health habits, and mm-hmm. the environment we live in. Mm-hmm. So if we as doctors are only focusing on what's happening when a patient's with us in our clinic walls, 
we're not going to be very effective. And so uh, I think one of the major shifts that needs to happen in healthcare in this country (laughs) is we have to shift some of our of our energy effort and resources out of our clinics, out of our hospitals, and into these type of community sort of mm-hmm. programming that really addresses that other 80% mm-hmm. of what, what affects your health outcome. Yeah, yeah. you answered my next question, <laughs> because my next question was exactly about the necessary shifts, you know, in the, in the current healthcare paradigm um, in order to bring those lifestyle medicine interventions to scale, you know, and make them accessible, accessible to all the yeah. patients. And trying to find the financial and institutional support Mm -hmm. for these types of programs where you're teaching young children, but you're also, you know, supporting elderly people who maybe need to learn a little bit of a different way of cooking than what they knew before. You're helping parents uh, Mm -hmm. figure out things that their children can do for physical activity or that they can do together as families. But I think the other piece of all this is if we do this, if we if we can, as a healthcare system, as a nation, shift more resources to mm-hmm. lifestyle medicine interventions that don't require a patient or family to take off work in the middle of the day to come to the hospital or come to the clinic yeah. or have an appointment, like do it out in their places of worship, their community center, their mm-hmm. Their elementary school bring it to them. Yeah. It to them mm-hmm. that what we will find is that we make a huge impact on our healthcare costs, but just as importantly, our healthcare workforce mm-hmm. will feel more energized and better because we, as doctors and nurses and dietitians and everybody, we get you know excited and energized when people get better. Right. But you see that so rarely in our current healthcare system. You know, people don't usually get better with the things that we do now they you may slow down their decline you know you may sort of halt it for a little while but they're not really getting better from their diabetes they're getting better from their um you know their high blood pressure so if we can make it so it's not this productivity model of how many people do you see and and how much can you bill yeah make it more about outcomes and are people getting better I think that we will address both our problem with the, the chronic disease epidemic and the cost in this country, but also our problem of burnout in our healthcare professionals. Um, yeah, yeah, which is uh, yeah, which is actually I think that you know as long as burnout is there, probably the the quality of healthcare will not be optimal. So I think we need to address the burnout as one of the priorities of the American healthcare. Um, as long as you know, we think about it and and pursue the burnout mitigation, we should be fine. Um, okay. you know, together with other other tasks. So um, you you mentioned to me that your your son Keith Greg is going to start okay. medical school this year. And he's aspiring to become a lifestyle medicine physician. And he will join the, the ranks of, of other lifestyle medicine practitioners and amazing, you know, amazing uh, specialty that we have here. So tell me about Keith, a um, couple, of, couple of words about him and his dreams and aspirations. Oh, I would love to. <laughs> and uh, I have to say, I've been really blessed by both of my children because both uh, my daughter, Amanda, and my son, Keith, have been very, very instrumental in, um, one, helping me learn about uh, this this type of lifestyle medicine because I realized as a physician that this is something that I really needed to learn for my own kids, watching what was happening in the, um, you know, the, the children of their generation, yeah. I needed to figure out like what was happening and, and how to try to prevent that or assist with my own kids. And then as they got older, my daughter, Amanda is actually um, a chef. She's our culinary medicine, uh, our director of culinary medicine for Kellen foundation. Right. I met, I met Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. yeah. I met, I met your daughter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you say? I met your daughter. She's amazing. That's right. Yeah. You did. Yeah. 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 You came off her vest. Yeah, right. Awesome. Yeah. And so she has learned how to make healthy food, like absolutely cravingly delicious. And I often say that she actually is going to save more lives than I do as a physician because (laughs) she can help people eat this way and enjoy it because it's such great food that she's actually having more of an impact than than many of us do as physicians long term. So luckily, she, we've got the we've got the food piece with Amanda, and then Keith, as he uh, as he grew up, he really 
decided that he wanted to become a physician and that he wanted to be able to do the types of things that, that um, we do at Callen Foundation and that he has seen with other lifestyle medicine pioneers. Um, he's actually a medical scribe right now for Dr. Ron Weiss at Ethos Health in New Jersey, which is another amazing lifestyle medicine pioneer physician doing really, really great things. So this is what Keith has seen of the medical system is doctors like me and Dr. Weiss and Dr. Dave Donahue and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Dr. John Kelly, who, uh, who we've been fortunate to be friends with for a long time. So he's seen this as what he would perceive as the, not the norm. He knows there's a lot of other stuff out there, but like that, this is the goal. This is the, this is the way that medicine should be. So I'm really going to enjoy watching him go through the process of becoming a physician because I think he'll be another one of those, um, you know, kind of innovators. Like I was mentioning some of my other medical students and residents that I currently teach who are just basically saying like, no, there's a better way to do this. And that's how we're going to practice as physicians. Mm-hmm. Well, one proud mom, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have two. Uh, my my children are like my partners in this work here in the community, which is amazing. Yeah, this is amazing, amazing continuity, amazing legacy, Dr. Gregor. And um, to wrap it up today, um, where can our listeners find you physically and online? Okay, so online, the best place would be through our website, which is www.kellen.org, and Kellen is K-E-L-L-Y-N. Uh, we are also on Facebook, so you can find us there. Uh, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram, so if you just search for Kellen, K-E-L-L-Y-N, you'll, you'll find us on those places. Uh, we are actually located in Academy, Pennsylvania, which is right by Easton, Pennsylvania. We're kind of on the eastern part of Pennsylvania between Philly and New York. Uh, and every year we host something called the Lehigh Valley Veg Stock, which actually Dr. Shamoon was one of our speakers last year, which was awesome. She came up and talked uh, to our crew. But Lehigh Valley Veg Stock is a festival where we, we celebrate healthy lifestyles and healthy harvest festival and crafts and lifestyle medicine lectures and music and all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, this year it will be on October 14th. So if you are interested in looking at um, and coming to join us for that, you can find more information about that on the Kellen Foundation website. And there's also a Lehigh Valley Veg Stock uh, website, which is lvvegstock.org. Um, and I think that's, and also you can find me at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine next, uh, in October in Denver, because I'm very excited to be the conference chair for LM 2023. And I look forward to seeing all these wonderful lifestyle medicine pioneers and all the exciting energy of the lifestyle medicine tribe out there again this year. Wow. What a wonderful conversation today. Uh, Dr. Megan Greger, the co-founder and chief medical officer of the Kellen Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to making the healthy choice the easy choice. Thank you so much for coming to this episode of the Cardio Seeds podcast today. It was pleasure and honor to have you today. Thank you, Dr. Shimon. Yes, and this is all for today's episode. It was your host, Dr. Svetlana Shamoon, a lifestyle cardiologist and the founder and president of Cardio Seeds. Thank you for listening and see you soon. Bye-bye.